we're talking uh, tonight about Mother Mary. Okay, I hate even saying that, saying it that way, but uh, this is something that comes up a lot, especially this time of year. You know, you've seen a lot of the nativities all about. You know, uh, I'm not against nativity scenes. Somebody people say, well, isn't that a graven image? Well, I've I've preached on that before. I don't think that that is uh, exactly what that commandment's talking about. But here's what the commandment is talking about. There are people that have statues of Mary all around, and they have statues in the house, and they bow down to it, and they pray for it, and all that. Now, that's a graven image, and as uh, something that they bow down, and they worship. And so, uh, uh, this idea of what, uh, in theology, they call it Mariology. I mean, it sounds like that, you know, that you're worshiping Mary, which, I mean, they are <laughs> in many ways, but Mariology just means the study of the doctrines concerning Mary, okay? So, the first point I want to bring out is what some people believe today about Mary. It's, uh, it's amazing, really, the extent people will go to, you know, you've got... You've got Jesus, God with us, right? He came down, Emmanuel, and uh, and he's he, he's you know took away the sins of the world. God said to glorify Him. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The Bible says, like in Him, you know, uh, He He has the preeminence, and we're all supposed to worship Him. All these things, and yet people try so hard to find somebody else that they need to pray to or somebody else that they need to lift up or exalt. Maybe it's the little angel in the dashboard or uh, you know something, uh, people all year round. Uh, I remember seeing this, uh, uh, you know, don't throw stones at me, but I remember seeing that uh, Nardia, Nar Narnia, what's, it, what's the full name of it? Something of Narnia, Articles of Narnia. And, uh, and here's this thing, it's supposed to have pictures of Jesus as like this, this lion. And so there's this lion in the movie. And I really am not familiar with the whole background of the story. But all of a sudden we were watching that and out pops Santa Claus. Like where did that come from? <laughs> People want to put Santa Claus in the same category as, uh, as Jesus. I, again, I don't know the whole story behind that, uh, but I know that it's in there. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's weird what people will attribute the, their praise to and their glory and, and what they'll worship above Jesus. And whenever you talk to them, they'll be like, oh, no, 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 we worship Jesus. It's just he's so high and holy that we have to go through the saints. We have to go through Mary. We have to go through these angels or whatever. And it's like, where do you see in the Bible it tell, where it tells you to do that? It says we can go boldly before the throne of the Father through Jesus Christ. I mean, why, why do we need, you know, we went through Jesus Christ to get to the Father, right? I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We had to go through Jesus Christ to get to the Father, and now we're kings and priests before Him. I mean, we can go straight to the throne of God, and uh, and we don't need uh, anybody else. There's one mediator between God and man. That's the Lord, uh, the the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, uh, so anyway, some people will go through these these uh, great steps. You know, in the Catholics, I bring those up a lot. That this message uh, is going to obviously have a lot to do with some Catholic beliefs, okay? But What's some things that they'll do? The crucifix. You ever seen somebody in rough times, what are they doing? They're kissing the crucifix. Now they'll tell you, well, I'm doing this, you know, because of my love for the Lord or whatever. And I'm like, I don't know. I think that you're just wanting something tangible that you can see now and that you can give all your affection to. And I'm telling you what, all your praise and affection to that statue or whatever isn't reaching God. <laughs> it's not going past that statue or, or a graven image. Okay, so it's amazing what people would do. Here are some of the things that many people don't know about uh, the extent to which where people uh, uh, exalt and magnify Mary. You know, there's actually a day called Mary Mass. We have Christmas, Christmas, and we have Mary Mass. <laughs> I don't know what day that is, but they actually have a day that is uh, where they spend the day celebrating Mary. Now, again, if some as a Catholic priest will tell you what their reasoning is behind it, but I'm going to tell you this, they're not going to get it from the Bible because there's nowhere in the Bible where it tells us to uh, uh, to give Mary that kind of uh, honor. Also, there's uh, something that people don't know. Now, I'll, I'll be honest. I grew up thinking, as most people do, the Immaculate Conception. My whole life, I thought that meant the birth of Jesus Christ. He was born without sin, born of a virgin, and I thought that was the Immaculate Conception. And there's actually been people on uh, the news who, of late, have gotten... 
uh, kind of called out on that because they have used that idea about Jesus and they've said the Immaculate Conception. And then the other host, you know, I can't think of any names or anything, but the other host got on there and said, hey, if you're going to use that, you need to use it right. The Immaculate Conception is not about Jesus, it's about Mary. How many of you guys knew that the Immaculate Conception is this belief that Mary was born in such a way that she was without sin as everybody else in the world that's born, but she had this special birth. And I believe the legend is that it's not that she, that she was born of a virgin, but that her mother and her father, and you don't find anywhere in the Bible where it mentions her mother and father. All the genealogies in the Bible go back, and then it brings up to, uh, 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 you know, to um, Joseph. Okay, and uh, so we don't know anywhere, I should say this, we don't know who her mother was. And in the apocryphal books, I guess somewhere, or some historic book or whatever, somebody said her mother's name is Anne. And so you'll see that in the Catholic Church, a lot of times they'll, they'll talk about this Anne, which is the mother of Mary, which I imagine that they glorify her as well, even though she's not even in the Bible. Okay, but apparently her, Mary's mother and father, they say, it's not in the Bible, didn't happen, okay, but this is what their, uh, their claim is. Because they want so badly for Mary to be, you know, sinless and perfect and have some kind of supernatural uh, 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 presence. But they say that they were uh, not able to have children. They were barren. There was, you know, there was not any way to conceive. And so God just, in a similar fashion to a virgin birth, God just put Mary into that. Uh, that womb or whatever without, you know, the actual normal process. Well, that'd be pretty convenient for anybody to say, right, that that's what happened. Uh, nothing in the Bible talks about that. But when they use the word, uh, the phrase immaculate conception, they're saying that Mary was free from original sin. And not only that, because, you know, I'm not a big fan of the phrase original sin. You know, I think that, yes, through Adam, sin has passed on to all of us. But we're only guilty because we've sinned. We can't blame Adam. Like the only reason anybody is going to go to hell is because Adam sinned. No, the only reason anybody goes to hell is because of their own sin. You know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We can't really blame that on Adam, although we understand that he was the father of, uh, of all that. And we're just naturally following after our father. But the responsibility is on us. And so I'm even like talking about original sin. But not only do they go as far as to say that Mary was conceived without original sin, but they say she continued a life of sinless perfection. I mean, that's blasphemy right there, because the Bible makes it clear, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And they say, no, no, all except for Mary. <laughs> you know, uh, So this is uh, something that they, uh, they claim. Also, they claim perpetual virginity. They say that she remained a virgin uh, for her whole life. You know, Even though the Bible specifically says that they didn't come together until Jesus was born, implying that after Jesus was born, then they came together, right? But, uh, but also it says in the Bible that uh, Jesus had brothers and, and a sister, and it mentions their names. Now, here's what they'll try to say. They'll say that, well, Joseph uh, was a widow or a widower, I guess, and his wife died and, and he had other children with that wife. And so that's why they're, but that's not in the Bible. The Bible just says, it says brother and sister, and you put two and two together and it makes sense. But other people want to finagle something in there and rest the scriptures to fit some strange doctrine that glorifies Mary. Now I've got some ideas about that that aren't even in the text here really. But uh, if you follow the history, uh, I'm not going to preach a whole sermon on this aspect of it, but if you follow the history of Catholicism, uh, you know, in the early days of Catholicism, basically it was being spread by force. They were making, you know, towns, they'd go in and fight these wars and they would make these people convert to quote unquote Christianity. And so these people would convert to Christianity. They would adopt some of the Christian traditions, adopt some of the Christian terminology or whatever. And then they would just apply that to their gods and everything. So interestingly, uh, you know, in, in the Bible, we see in Ephesus, who was the goddess that everybody in, in, in all the Ephesians were worshiping? Diana, right? Now, Diana, interestingly enough, was referred to as the queen of heaven. Guess what they refer to Mary as? Queen of heaven. 
Okay, and uh, and it's interesting too. One other thing I didn't say was uh, another belief about Mary that some have is the ascension. Okay, another word for that is the assumption. Well, they're definitely making an assumption, <laughs> all right? But it's not based on the Bible. But it's called the assumption or the ascension, meaning that they believe that because Mary was sinless, because she was you know immaculate conception, because all this stuff, well, surely she didn't die like a regular man person and so uh so they believe that she ascended up into heaven bodily just like jesus again blasphemy because the bible says jesus is the first fruits and uh, he's the only one who has risen bodily now get me started on uh on elijah and enoch okay i've already talked about that in other messages <laughs> but uh uh but they believe that mary ascended up bodily into into heaven and guess where there is a place where there's a church or a shrine of some sort where they believe was the location that Mary ascended up into heaven, Ephesus. I, I don't know. I just find that interesting. Okay, so uh, you follow the history, and it's, it, it seems pretty, pretty weird how a lot of the pagan traditions were just adopted by those who converted to Christianity, and then they just started calling their pagan gods by these names, and they started doing some of the traditional uh, pagan practices and it's attributing it to Christianity and saying like, you know, hey, the, Mary is the, the queen of heaven. And, uh, and anyway, that's pretty interesting. Now following are some of the titles that are given to Mary based on some of those beliefs that we just said and based on what was just read from Matthew chapter one. Uh, but they totally take things out of context and make them mean something that they're not supposed to mean. All right, here's some just basic titles. You can look this up and see uh, the most blessed, the most blessed, you know, because it says thou art blessed among women. So they call her the most blessed. The Virgin Mary, we're used to that, or Holy Mary or Saint Mary. Nothing too shocking there. Uh, one person, uh, Irenaeus from the second century, because of his writings, she became known as the cause of our salvation. What in the world? The cause of our salvation, Mary? Well, yeah, well, if it wasn't without, if it wasn't for her, Jesus wouldn't have been born. You mean to tell me God couldn't have put Jesus in another womb? <laughs> you know, that's a, a okay. That's a that's another story. The mother of God. Now that's weird. Now people can justify that and say, "Well, isn't Jesus God?" Well, yeah, Jesus is God, but you know, the whole Trinity is God: God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And by saying she's the mother of God, it's almost like she's higher than God, right? And she, she's not higher than God. She's just the mother of the man, Jesus. Now, she's not the mother of, of the, uh, the God, Jesus. Does that make sense? Because Jesus is God and he's man. She's the mother of the man, but not the mother of God. Remember whenever she is like, what are you doing? We couldn't find you anywhere. Why did you run off? And Jesus says, no, you're not that I must be about my father's business. You know, it's like, hey, you're, you, you are my mother. I respect you in the flesh. I honor you. I obey you. The Bible says that he did all those things. However, he had a job to do because his authority was given by his father, which was a spiritual mission that he had on earth. And it wasn't the, uh, just a, a mission of the flesh. Okay, so uh, anyway, it's weird to call her mother of God. The most pure, the most holy, the immaculate. Our Lady, that's a common one. You'll see a lot of churches called uh, Our Lady of such and such. The Queen of Heaven, I already, already talked about that. Also the name given to uh, the goddess Diana. So what I want to do in this message is, and I mean, I already gave you my first point, but uh, I want to spend a little bit of time on the next point, which is this. So that was what some people today talk about, uh, say about Mary. What does the Bible say about Mary? Specifically, I want to look at what the characters in this chapter, Luke chapter 1, what do they say about Mary? All right, so I'm going to go through these and look at these uh, again. I'm not going to uh, read every chapter, every verse here. Um, try not to anyway. Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 26. Okay, first let's look at what Gabriel says about Mary. All right, Gab Gabriel's the one that comes on the scene and announces to Mary that she's with child of the Holy Ghost and uh, the Savior is going to be born unto her. And so he says this in verse 26. He says, uh, And in the sixth month, uh, the angel Gabriel was sent to God, uh, from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, 
Thou that are highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now you can see how people could take that and read into it a lot of things. Say, oh, she's, she, is, uh, uh, she is blessed, right? She is highly favored. What does it say? She is, uh, uh, she has found favor with God. And it says, uh, uh, you know, blessed uh, of God. Here's the thing that I thought about when it says you're highly favored. You know, throughout the Bible, God would reveal himself to people. For instance, he comes to Noah and it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And it's that, it even says in the Bible that, you know, there was no other person at that time, you know, more righteous than Noah, basically. He was perfect and upright and eschewed evil. I might be, that might be the attribution to, uh, to Job. But my point is this, that God says these kinds of things about lots of people. He, he favors them in a way that says, you know what? I'm going to pick this person in the world at this time, and here's the person that I'm going to reveal myself to. And actually, that's how he did with all the prophets, if you think about it. The prophets literally were the people that received the Word of God, and then they listened to that Word of God, and they went and took that to the world. Each of those people were highly favored, and each of those people were uh, men that God had just come down to and said, hey, you, you know, you've found favor in my eyes, and so I'm going to use you to carry out my Word. Basically the same thing that he's doing with, uh, with Mary. Okay, so, so yeah, she's highly favored. It says that the Lord is with thee. That kind of almost has a double meaning if you think about it. The Lord was with thee in the sense that he put the, this child inside her womb. But not only that, the Lord was literally with her, right, inside, uh, inside her womb. It says, blessed art thou among women. We'll talk about that more here in a little bit. Uh, verse uh, 4, thou hast found favor with God. Okay, so Gabriel does say that there that God did favor her. Of course we know that. I mean, God put chose her for a reason to put Jesus in her womb. There was something about Mary that fulfilled first of all all the promises that had been given, right? I'm not saying he chose her because of the fulfillment. God doesn't dwell in uh in our time and space, I understand that. So, so he already foreknew what was going to happen. But when this happened, it was the fulfillment of all these other prophecies we can read in the Old Testament that said Jesus was going to be born of a woman. That goes all the way back to Eve and the seed of Eve. Uh, and then it talks to he talks to Abraham, and he says that the line, from his lineage, uh, the Savior is going to come out, and all the world's going to be blessed. And then we see, obviously, uh, Jacob is given that promise, Israel. And then, uh, and then Judah, you know, from the, the tribe of Judah is, is going to come uh, 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 Shiloh. And then we see, you know, it keeps going until King David. And then finally Jesus comes through this lineage, which Mary happened to be in this lineage. And so, uh, and so she, he, God chose her. She obviously was... Uh, uh, was an up, upright woman. It said earlier on in the chapter, I can't remember exactly where, but it said that uh, Mary was, let's see if I can find that. Um, let me see here. Oh, no, here's what I was going to say. Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Zach, Zacharias, it says that they were, upright and blameless i can't find it this second but i know it's in there uh, they were up they were uh they were blameless before god thank you it says that they they were walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the lord blameless now couldn't they take that and say oh we better revere elizabeth and make her something special oh well guess what they do they actually have a, a saint elizabeth day as well as part of the, uh, I don't know, I think it's like in November or something like that. So it's just crazy how they want to take these people that God showed favor to, make them, you know, saints. And by that, I'm using their definition of somebody who's just holy and perfect, and we need to revere them and, and give them praise, which they would never ask for. They want us to praise the Lord and not them. Okay, but this is the case. Now, what is Elizabeth then? I already talked about her standing before God. What does Elizabeth say about Mary? Look at verse 39. We see in verse 39, uh, 
there's this speech that she's given. I'm just going to point through some highlights here. It says in verse uh, 42, it says, Blessed art thou among women. You know, I, I believe all the way back to Eve, you know, because Cain killed Abel, you know, already things are messed up. And then, uh, and then she has another son, Seth. And she's so excited and she says, I have been given a child from the Lord. And, you know, I kind of feel like she's taking any of the prophes prophecies about the, the seed or whatever and probably thinking that, hey, man, he, he must be the one. And I got this feeling that all throughout history, every time a woman would have a child, it's like, maybe this is the one. Maybe this is our Savior. I mean, uh, Moses' name meant Savior. And in a way, he did, you know, help to bring the people out of, out of, uh, uh, out of Egypt you know what I mean? But I, I kind of feel like the idea, the reason the women in Israel wanted so badly to have a child, because you see the ones that weren't able to have children, and it was just like, you know, they were doing everything they could, just begging God to give them children, which I feel like should be a natural thing that a woman wants anyway. Uh, but in this case, I feel like the, the greatest thing in the world was to be able to, you know, fulfill that promise and have a child who was, you know, the son of God. Now, whenever she receives this, that means that she's now highly favored among, among women. Or as Elizabeth said, blessed art thou among women, right? You were the one woman that was chosen to carry the most important child throughout all history that ever was or that ever will be, the, the, the child. That was an honored position. There's no doubt about that. It didn't make Mary special. Though. It just made God special uh, for what he was about to do. And she felt very blessed by that, which we'll get to in a minute. But blessed art thou among women, for sure she was. And then she, and then Elizabeth says, she calls her the mother of my Lord in verse 43. You know, you, she recognized that the child that was in her Mary's womb was her Lord. And you are the one that was blessed to be able to have my Lord uh, in your womb. In verse 45, uh, she says an interesting thing. Look at verse 45. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, that's kind of interesting because Elizabeth is saying, like, not only, you know, is it amazing that you're with child, but it's amazing that you believed Gabriel when he came and said, you're going to be with child of the Holy Ghost. And you believe that. And that's pretty interesting, right? She, she believed God. And, uh, and she said, hey, you know, this is the Savior that's coming into the world. She already was trusting in the Messiah which in the Old Testament times, that would be the equivalent of saying she was saved. She believed in the Lord. She believed in the, uh, the prophecies and everything that was coming to pass. And so when angel Gabriel came and said, hey, you're going to be with child, she said, how's this going to be since I know not man? She didn't say, yeah, right, that can't happen. Kind of remember when Sarah laughs and she's like, how can I have a child in my old age? And the angels scold her for laughing. But in this case, you know, Mary just says, well, how could this be? I don't understand it. But she believed. And so Elizabeth does point out this. Uh, this is in the inspired word of God that Mary believed. And so God was going to perform all those things uh, that she said. Now, what does Mary say about Mary? That's an important question. How did Mary feel about herself? Was she, now you would expect if she's holy and righteous that she would be humble. Uh, but the fact is, like, what does she think her authority is? What does she think? This honored position grants her, you know, is she going to be able to, you know, all the kings, you ever read through the book of Kings and Chronicles, and it would mention a king, and then it would say, and his, and his mother's name was, and then it would give his mother's name, and it's kind of like, well, why did he mention his mother? Right? Because that mother had an important part in that child's life, obviously raised him, and so even on the kingdom, a lot of times their mother would be almost like a counselor to them, right? Except in the cases where the mother was evil, and then you got somebody <laughs> like a... Uh, uh, Give me an example. I think Asa was one of them. Josiah was another one that that said, "Hey, you know, I got to kick my mom, my mom out of here. <laughs> she's a uh, uh, she's giving bad advice and all this kind of stuff. She's worshiping other gods." Okay, but uh, but that was the case. So I mean, what does Mary think? Am I going to be able to tell Jesus what to do whenever he grows up? I mean, uh, do I get to say how the kingdom is going to be run and and all this kind of stuff? What does she say? So look at verse forty six. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. You know what that means? 
That means Mary needed a savior. Why does Mary need a savior? Because Mary's a sinner, just like everybody's a sinner. So it's ridiculous that somebody would think that she's without sin. Mary needed a savior. So here's some things that she says. Verse uh, uh, 46, my soul doth magnify the Lord. Verse 47, my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my savior. In verse 48, she talks about herself as being someone of low estate. Uh, in verse 48, she says that all generations shall call me blessed. That's for sure. <laughs> they do, but they just took it a, a little bit too far. It's not just like, wow, she was the blessed. I mean, all you got to do is read the Bible every Christmas, and you'll know that Mary was blessed. You don't have to worship her, <laughs> right? But all uh, generations shall call me blessed. He that is mighty, she says in verse 49, hath done great things. She's given all the credit to the Lord, of course. Verse 49, holy is his name. Verse 50, his mercy is on them that fear. That kind of goes along with uh, Elizabeth's word saying that she believed, right? Because a lot of times in the Bible, believing on the Lord and fearing the Lord seem to kind of go hand in hand. Uh, Mary believed in the Lord. She feared the Lord and God showed mercy unto her. So then she starts talking about how, how much, uh, you know, those people who don't fear the Lord aren't blessed. He has scattered, verse 51, has scattered the, pow uh, the powered, uh, in the imagination of their hearts. Uh, I'm sorry, The how does it say? I better read that. Verse 51. He hath showed strength with his arms. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. I don't know what I was reading. <laughs> okay. Uh, verse 52. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. Now, she definitely recognized that she was of a low estate or of a low degree. Uh, we have uh, good uh, evidence from Scripture that she and Joseph were poor, and who knows what their families were before that, but together they seemed, uh, seems like they were poor, and she recognizes that she wasn't in any kind of a, a lofty state. She certainly didn't earn or deserve this title from a, from a human perspective. Verse 53, He hath filled the hungry, sent the rich away empty, Verse 54, he hath hoped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Okay, so basically she just recognizes that she's nobody, but that God has used her to fulfill all these promises to the world about how the Messiah was going to come and how he was going to come through Israel, the seed of Israel, and how he was going to uh, uh, bless the world through that. So she recognizes that she was just part of that. Okay, now I want to give the third point, the final point, and look at this a little closer. And that is this. What did Jesus say about Mary? Okay, because we have uh, what people think today about Mary. We have what these characters said, uh, Gabriel, Elizabeth, what, what Mary even said about herself. But if anyone's going to tell us how we ought to feel about Mother Mary, shouldn't it be Jesus? Okay, so there's a couple times in the Bible that we get an idea uh, of how Jesus, the words that he uses to explain what our, what our feelings towards Mary should be. And again, I'm, I'm not knocking the fact that she was a good woman. She was upright. She obeyed the commandments of God, just like Elizabeth did, just like Zacharias did, uh, just like a, those throughout history who followed the Lord and tried to live for him. God said, hey, I found favor. It says that Elizabeth was blameless. Like, guess what? One of the qualifications for a pastor and for a deacon is that they need to be blameless and the husband of one wife and all these things that it says after that blameless just means people can't look at you and say, Oh man, that guy's got all these, you know, skeletons in the closet and all these things uh, in his background that disqualifies him from having a position. It just means that she was upstanding citizen and she was a good person and she served the Lord and feared the Lord. And so, uh, and so that was the idea. What does Jesus say though? Look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, 40, verse 46. <clears throat> While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. Now, Jesus was busy preaching, you know, healing people, doing all these kinds of things. 
Uh, they come to him and say, hey, your brother and your mother are out there waiting to talk to you. He didn't say, oh, everybody stop right now and light a candle. <laughs> you know? He didn't say, get out the prayer beads, Mother Mary, full of grace. <laughs> I mean, there's, where did you get any of this? He doesn't say, oh, stop what you're doing, everybody, and go down and bow at his mother's feet or something like that. Uh, I mean, I don't think anybody, even by Catholic doctrine, would say that Jesus was, was bowing to Mary. But I'm just saying, there was nothing there where he says, okay, everybody stop and understand, this is the woman. If you want anything from me, you have to go through her. <laughs> now, we do have before he began his public ministry, or I guess right after, he, no, it was before he began his public ministry. I can't remember, John chapter 2, <laughs> where, he does, where he changes water into wine. Uh, we do have that case where his mother, you know, basically asks his help. She's like, oh, I don't know what to do. We ran out. And, uh, and anyway, but she kind of gets, you know, asks his advice and gets his permission. Of course, even in that reference, he's like, woman, what have I to do with thee? <laughs> I don't think that was really a derogatory term, but it's like, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. Okay, so, uh, uh, so anyway, here's what it says in uh, verse 48. He answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brother? Now don't misunderstand me and think that I'm saying that Jesus disrespected his mom or didn't care about his mom. That's not the point that he's making. And we see other evidence that that's not the case at all. But when he's making this point to them, he's like, You know what? I'm not going to stop serving my father, which is in heaven, and doing what he's put me on this earth to do. He's only got a short time left before he, you know, the crucifixion and all that stuff. I'm not going to stop that. You know, just every time my mother's here, or whatever. That's one thing that he's saying. Also, he's just saying this. He's saying like, you know, uh, here's a good thing for us to learn, because this is true for us. What I'm about to say is true for us in a church situation. Your church uh, should be your family. Okay, your, the people that you worship with and you come to church with and all that kind of stuff. This isn't like a talk about some kind of weird cult or something. We're not talking about going out and moving out into the woods and starting a uh, commune, uh, commune or something like that. Uh, I mean, I'm saying sometimes that sounds like a good idea, but <laughs> but we're not talking about that. But we are family. And the Bible says that we're supposed to treat our, the, the women of the church like our sisters and our mothers and, uh, and the men like our brothers. Okay, that's why we call each other brother, uh, because we get this idea, we get to remind ourselves sometimes. I work in the world all week long, but when I come together, it's like, ah, it's good to be home with my family. That should be our attitude. And so Jesus kind of says this. He says, who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples. And he said, behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Now, it doesn't mean that he didn't have a physical responsibility to care for his mother and to love his mother and to obey and honor his mother, which he did his whole life, it seems like, from Scripture. <clears throat> but he's saying, my purpose here is more spiritual. And we're the same way. On this earth, we're spiritually born of God. We're a spiritual creature, a new creature inside. Yes, we live in this flesh. Yes, we have to obey the flesh to a degree. We got to feed ourselves. We got to work. We got to take care of one another and all that kind of stuff. But our mission and our goal on earth is a spiritual goal. And so our brothers and sisters who are spiritually brothers and sisters in Christ are important to us. And those are the ones that we ought to focus on. Again, not saying ignore your mother and father. That's not at all what I'm saying. In fact, the the best thing that could ever happen is that your mother and your father are also your brothers and sisters in Christ and spiritually, uh, you know, worshiping with you in church and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so uh, Jesus says, you know, he kind of he, he kind of doesn't give us any anything from this passage that would say, oh, wait, this is a good place in the Bible for me to put in this little footnote <laughs> that says, you know what, anything my mom ever uh, anything you ever want from me, you go to my mom and then she'll be an intercessor and she'll come to me. And if she convinces me that I should give you something, you know, then we'll listen to her. Pfft, you don't see that. You see exactly the opposite. He says, you know what? I'm more concerned about listening to uh, those who obey me and those who follow me, my disciples, you know, uh, uh, those are my brother and sister and mother and, and all that. And so, uh, so that definitely would rule out some of these thoughts that people have today about Mary. Look at Luke chapter, back to Luke chapter 11. I mean, back to Luke in chapter 11. <clears throat> I 
Look at verse 27. Many people have said this was the first uh, Catholic lady right here. And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which, hath, which thou hast sucked. Now, Jesus doesn't shoot her down necessarily. She's, she's saying this ignorantly. She's trying to respect him and be like, oh, you know, glory to Jesus. Blessed is the, the person who, you know, who, who bore you and, and raised you and all that stuff. That, for whatever reason, that was what was in her mind. But Jesus shoots that down. And he says in verse 28, he says, But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Isn't that interesting? Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Sounds a lot like what he said in uh, Matthew chapter 12, where he said, you know, those who obey me, those who uh, are my disciples, these are my brother and sister and all that. Okay, Those who hear the word of God and keep it. So the conclusion is simply this. Now it is true that uh, you can look in the Bible and see right before Jesus dies on the cross, he sees John. The Apostle John, he says, you know, John, uh, my mom, I'm, par I'm paraphrasing, of course, my mom's going to need a place to go. And so I want you to take her. And he looks at John and says, behold, your mother. And he's saying, basically, take her in, take care of her, uh, you know, because I'm going away. That was a proper thing to do, respectful thing to do, because he cared about his mom. He didn't want to leave this world and leave her, you know, st stranded and helpless and all that. We also read as we go through the book of Acts, Mary's still around. Uh, they're meeting together in houses where you see Mary's present. Mary, the mother of Jesus. There's lots of Marys in the Bible, but she's present. And we don't see any honored high position where they're all going to her for counsel or saying, Mother Mary, what shall we do? Right? They would go to Peter. They would go to James, one of these guys. But you don't ever see where they would go to Mary to ask advice. But Mary was there present. And so they took her in. They took care of her. She was definitely present as one of the disciples. I mean, not, you know, not the 12. I'm just saying a disciple of Jesus after uh, the resurrection. But she uh, was never asked to be worshipped, never asked to be the mediator between uh, uh, the followers of Christ and God. There's no evidence that she was sinless. No evidence that she was perpetual virgin. Certainly no evidence that she ascended up bodily up into heaven. These are all things that just man made up. In fact, here is all we know from the scriptures. Number one, she was a sinner because the Bible says everybody's a sinner. And she even herself said that she had the Lord, her Savior. Okay, which means that she needed a Savior because she is a sinner. She was a sinner who needed a Savior, according to her own testimony. Number two, we find that she believed God. She trusted in Him. She trusted the fact that Jesus was going to come be the Savior. Uh, she received that by Elizabeth's testimony, by her own testimony. We see also that she indeed was blessed by God to be the chosen for a womb to use for really, and this is where, you know, what did, they, what did uh, some people call her the... Uh, uh, the cause of our salvation. Well, she's not the cause of our salvation, but because, because God used a virgin birth, not necessarily Mary, Mary is no, not the cause, but because God used this concept of a virgin birth. I explain this a lot of times whenever I'm out uh, uh, soul winning because people don't seem to understand what the significance was of Jesus being on earth and Jesus dying on the cross. And, and it's really weird, but they just believe that their works are going to get them to heaven. They don't seem to understand. And it's funny, even Catholics, in fact, mainly Catholics don't understand the importance of the virgin birth, yet they make a big deal about the Virgin Mary and they make a big deal about this, but they don't, most of the ones you talk to, I'm not saying like the, the theologians or whatever, but the most people you talk to, they have no idea really what the significance is of the virgin birth. And so you have to explain to them and say like, man, this was what made the, the, the atonement for your sins possible. Why was it that Jesus had to die on the cross? Why was it that he was buried, but then he rose again victorious over sin? How was he able to do that? I'm like, well, I never really thought about it. I never really cared. I've asked somebody before, well, if you could get to heaven by your works, why did Jesus have to die? 
And they said, well, he died so that we could see how the world is going to treat that, the things that are good. And they killed him. And, and so we're supposed to look at that and be ashamed and say, oh, look how, look how we treated uh, the, the, the Lord, you know, whenever he was here. And we, we hung him on the cross and whatever. But, but they just act like though he's just a man. The virgin birth is evidence that he wasn't just a man. You say, yeah, but the virgin birth isn't possible. Duh. <laughs> the creation of the world through the spoken word of God isn't possible either, but it happened. You know, a man uh, shouldn't be able to walk on water, but he did. A man shouldn't be able to feed 5,000 from two fish and five loaves, but he did. Okay, so I don't have, I'm, not, I'm not bothered at all by a miracle. And the miracle was that God said, hey, this is the only way I can provide salvation to the world. Nobody can, uh, can take the place, you know, uh, the best he could do is an illustration by taking an animal, uh, a spotless lamb, and sacrificing it, fi sacrificing it, which was just a pretty weak picture, but it was the best that he could do. No human uh, could say, Lord, take my life. Moses tried it. The Apostle Paul tried it. didn't work. Lord, take my life for them so that they can be saved. You're just a man. You need somebody to die for you too. And so the virgin birth was a way in which God could be inside a, womb, a, a, a mother's womb. So you have the word of God through the holy power of the Holy Spirit who is now present inside the womb. Mary's now got the, the uh, you know, the, the, she's conceived a child with no man involved, no human man involved, and, and, and just got the, the God, uh, I guess, DNA. Jesus has got the DNA of God, spiritual DNA, as well as the DNA of the mother who is a human, and so now you have God and you have man. And because this man, even though he was born to a sinful woman, was also God. And so he was able to resist sin. He was able to not, he was tempted in every point. And we see him right after his baptism, even going to 40 days in the wilderness, being tempted by Satan. Uh, we know that he got hungry. We know that he got tired. All of those human temptations that we have, and yet he never sinned. Why? Because he was also God. Why is it that he had power to raise himself up from the dead after he, after he uh, was buried? Because he was God, okay? But it wouldn't really, if it was just God who came to earth, how could that really pay for our sins? It had to be a man who said, you know what? I'm going to take the punishment of their sins upon myself. It's a, it's a, it's a crazy and yet very awesome uh, doctrine, the virgin birth. And, you know, for many, many years since the, the whole enlightenment period or whatever in history, man has tried to even so-called people that call themselves Christians have tried to take away the doctrine of the virgin birth. It's really strange. You know, probably one of the most popular people that many, many don't realize this. He was a Baptist preacher who denied the virgin birth. Guess what his name was? Martin Luther King Jr. He didn't believe the virgin birth. He wrote a whole paper on that in college. You say, well, a Baptist preacher? That's what he called himself. But he didn't believe the virgin birth. And I'm telling you this, he wasn't saved at all. Okay. And so, uh, and so you, you have to realize this. For, you don't have to understand it by any means. But you have to understand that God was with us. God came to earth, right? And, uh, and maybe when somebody gets saved, they don't completely, they haven't heard all this explained to them. But when they see it in the Bible, it's just like, ah, oh, I accept that. It makes sense. I receive that because this was the only way of salvation. Adam, through the promised lineage uh, you know, of Abraham, David, etc., all the way up to Jesus, and then he fulfilled all things that, that had to be fulfilled in those prophecies. And, uh, and by the way, I want to leave you with this one thought. I just, I kind of thought about this, maybe it's cliche, probably heard it before, but, uh, but it just kind of struck out to me. Mary had the Son of God in her for nine months, carried her. I mean, the Son of God was in Mary for nine months. But actually, Mary was saved. So Mary had the Son of God in her heart, so to speak. I know the Bible doesn't actually use that direct phrase. In her heart for eternity. And those of us who are saved, you know, in Christ, the Bible says, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. We've got Christ in us for all eternity. You say, wow, Mary was so blessed to be able to have the Word of God in her. Well, guess what? If you're saved, you've got the Word of God in you. That's quite a thought, isn't it? 
you're blessed, not because you deserve it, because you need a Savior, just like Mary needs a Savior, just like everybody in the world needs a Savior. But if you receive Christ, you are highly favored and you are blessed among mankind because you have, uh, you have Jesus living in you. You have the Savior. And so uh, we can uh, rest assured uh, that our eternity is, set, is settled and that we have uh, the Lord in us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the virgin birth. And I thank you for Mary, Lord, but I am so uh, grieved and sorry that mankind has exalted her above to some degree. Maybe even many not understanding or knowing it uh, have exalted her above Jesus Christ and, or, or at least anybody else in the world. And I pray that you would just uh, help us to make the plan of salvation clear and simple as it is simple in the scripture so that others might have an opportunity to receive it or to reject it. And Lord, we know that all those who believe and all those that have fear of you and receive you, you will save from hell. And so we give you thanks for that wonderful truth. And this time of year at Christmas, as we see nativity scenes and we hear a lot of talk about Mary and the virgin birth, Lord, help us marvel at how wonderful of a doctrine that is and how, uh, and how wonderful your word is. But help us also recognize how uh, messed up the world is in, uh, in resting those scriptures and changing Mary to uh, have a different position than she actually does. Pray you be glorified in all things. Jesus, name I pray. Amen.